hello everybody and welcome to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's live video series and joining me today to share the stories behind the 10 books which made the biggest impact on his life is philosopher, lecturer, speaker and researcher Stephen Ross who also is the co-founder and CEO of the non-profit World Research Foundation which houses and you can see it behind him, just a small section of it, a 15,000 volume library with books dating back to 1492. And believe me, if you think that you've held some magical books in your hands, holding a book that was actually published in 1492 is off the charts. So for over 45 years, Stephen has not only researched, lectured and made presentations to government agencies, and hospital networks around the world on many subjects pertaining to health. He's also published three books, including his very recent Manly P. Hall's unpublished pages of the secret teachings of all ages and the shocking and eye-opening and nothing happened, but you can make it happen, which documents the truth behind some of the most important therapies and techniques discovered over the past 50 years that were proven to be safer and more effective than those in current use that have been deliberately ignored by the medical system. Stephen Ross, welcome. Thank you, Sandy. Again, Steve thank you so much. Stephen, you're welcome. It's good to have you here. You know, we usually open up by asking people what books mean to them. Um, I hesitate to ask you that question because we can see just a small smidgen of your library behind you. And given what I've just um, read to everybody, well, we all know what books mean to you. So perhaps you might like to talk about um, your history with books, your first introduction to books or to meaningful books. Again, thank you. Um, I have a background in math and science, business and sports. And it was in 1968 when I sustained a knee injury at my university that I was sent to the sports physician for the Los Angeles Rams and Dodgers who said I'd have to have surgery or I could never compete again. And I went back to my trainer's room, found a popular mechanics magazine, which has nothing to do with medicine found a therapy, asked these experts if it would work, and they said no, but I decided to use it on my own. And I missed four weeks of training and that year placed fifth in the United States for my event. But a seed was planted, Sandy, for why was I told something wouldn't work and what other things exist in this world that we're not told about? So off I went from the Los Angeles area, starting to make contacts around the world to discover what may be out there. So that was one stream where I was accumulating materials. That was 1968. Now in 1973, I met a Cherokee Indian who told me all my future guidance would come in my dreams. And I remember laughing because I didn't recall my dreams. But one week later, I had a very important dream, which I followed through. I then would have six and seven dreams a night for months. And in these dreams, I was given information to not only look up people and techniques I had never heard about, but sent me around the world. And so that became another source of me accumulating more of the spiritual side. The injury was more of the physical, but it was this meeting with this Cherokee Indian and his guidance initially where that started my pursuit of everything and anything in the esoteric spiritual field. You also say that your first introduction to the spiritual aspects of life came when you had a reading from a trans medium in 1975. Yes, and that individual, I, I was very surprised, actually recommended 
uh, two books for me, which are actually the first two books on my list of the, the most influential materials that I have found throughout my travel. It, it's funny, I just must interject this. Before the advent of iPhone, when I used to fly internationally, having a big library like this, I could never decide which books to bring on the airplane for a 10 and a half hour flight. I used to just be frozen. Uh, do I want to read this? Do I want to read that? But uh, these 10 books would be the books that I could read over and over again without any problem. So do you have these 10 books on your iPhone? I do actually, it's been amazing. This is the great aspect of technology. However, there is nothing like holding a book in your hand. And Sandy, as you brought the introduction in, holding these books with their vibrations, 14 hundreds, 15, um, you will obviously never have that in a computer or in a cell phone. Yeah, yeah. Somebody tried to kill off books, but they didn't do a very good job, did they? <laughs> they haven't. We're doing our best to preserve and protect uh, these books. And, and again, these books uh, behind me, um, spirituality, psychology, dreams, alchemy, um, alternative medicine, I would hope that these will continue on because uh, in continuing on, uh, knowledge is not lost. And we want to make sure when true seekers are looking, they'll be able to find what they need. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more because you've got some interesting stuff to say about uh, when you had that um, session with that chance medium. You know, yes. Spirit came through and gave you some incredible information about the body. Uh, yes. In fact, at that time, this individual, his, his name was Edward A. Monroe. And interestingly enough, before the great psychic Edgar Casey died, they asked him who would continue his work. Now, in early editions, he said E.A.M., born in the tri-state area. After the first editions, after um, his death, I never saw a reference again to E.A.M., but Edward A. Monroe I met, he would go into trance and have spirit doctors who said, and this was in 75, that they were using equipment from the year 2030 to scan the body. So I ended up with a complete physical scan, but again, told that all my future guidance would come in, in my dreams. And as I just referenced a few moments ago, because I followed through with the first dream that was given to me, which for me personally at the time was not something positive. It was something speaking about my personality. Uh, I followed through with it and the six and seven dreams I had a night after that were on every phase of my personality, my likes, my dislikes. Then I was given telephone numbers and Sandy, I would call those numbers. Uh, at 26 years old, I was, oh my gosh, what? What am I going to do with a, a number? Here's how clever. I'll ask if Jim's there. So I would call and say, hello, is, is Jim there? Steve, we've been waiting for you, would be a voice. We want you to come. We want you to go. And we have information we want you to caretake. And what is here and just out of the camera has been accumulated through my journeys of following that inner spiritual guidance. So they've come to you, you haven't gone to them. Uh, that has been how it is. That, um, and I can identify the spirits. They come across slightly uh, different in their vibration uh, and what they're giving to me. Some have been um, helpful in giving poetry through me. I do not write poetry during the day, but for the last 46 years, I have received poetry at night. I know who the spirit is who has been giving me that, but it has been complete spiritual guidance through a poetic medium. Uh, other times when I've done healing with people, there is another entity. So I 
even with my business and uh, fact, 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 scientific background, the spiritual world is closer to me and I have more residents than what we have in our material world here. So 10 books, how did you choose? After, after you had me think about this, because I had never really thought about it, I started looking at what was my reaction after reading the book? What sort of enlightenment did I feel that I gained from these materials? And this is why, as I look back and chose these, I could actually say, wow, as a result, of reading that, I opened up an entire either area of research that I had never thought about, or something changed, something actually changed within myself that was tangible and I knew something was different. And so these books are from scientific to spiritual, esoteric, but each one of them was impactful for my life. But I do wanna add this, this was my journey. So I am not saying that these 10 books are the gospel for anybody else, but they are a jumping off point as good books should be. We should always be able to go beyond the, the book that we read because again, I don't know of any book that someone can say works for 100% of the people and is absolutely accurate. They're accurate enough to stimulate us and that is the key of books. Yeah. Okay, so let's start with book number one, The Spirit's Book by Alan Kardec. The Spirit's Book and Alan Kardec is very interesting because Kardec lived in the 1850s. And the Spirit's Book is an accumulation of 1,000 questions and answers put forth to a collection of spirits in the 1850s. And I have to say that when you go through these questions and they were asked through mediums at the time. Alan Kardec himself was not a medium, but he formulated a thousand questions asked of the spiritual world and what their response was. And here's why I'd like it. Some of the modern mediums channel through information from spirit, how to get the better job, how to win the woman, how to get a, a, a wonderful car, but in the 1850s, this was pure spiritual information about the spiritual world, how spirits view what takes place on the earth plane. And it was thrilling for me because just going from the question to the question, again, all the things that I would have thought in my mind important, Kardec answered. The Kardecian philosophy um, was very strong in Brazil. And to this day, on Alec Kardec's bra um, grave in France, actually, fresh flowers have appeared every single day since his death in the 1860s. So that book was a great jumping off point for me to really get the cerebral aspect working. Do you recall an answer to a question that really blew your socks off? I, that was quite a long time ago. Sometimes it's hard to remember what I did two weeks ago, but we'll go back 40, 46 years. Um, what blew my socks off was the whole aspect of the spiritual world that I just had not given that much thought to the love, it's the love coming through the answers to the questions that it wasn't a, it wasn't coming from ego. It wasn't coming to put the questionnaire down. I could feel the love coming through that book. 
And it was very difficult for me to get this in the 70s. Thankfully, now it's been reprinted. It's a book people can find on Amazon. It's love. It is the love. And in most of these books, you're going to hear me repeat that. It's the love coming through. Yeah. Okay. So number two, Wisdom of the Overself by Paul Brunton. Yeah, the, the wisdom of the overself, and I, I'm hoping people can see this clearly. Mm -hmm. I was told that, and, and it, there were only two books that were recommended to me through the, the channel and the Cherokee Indian. The wisdom of the overself is supposed to be the most closest approximation of how the overself interacts with with our conscious being and it its author paul brunton has written numerous books um the hidden teachings beyond yoga the quest of the overself many many books he he was a prolific writer uh, a caucasian who was steeped in eastern mysticism why that book was impactful is it, it explains in really nice philosophical terms about this higher essence of ourselves, the over-self. Uh, Emerson called it the over-soul, but it's all basically the same thing. This book is a grind them out book. Uh, I usually can read fairly quickly. This is a book where you, you read a page and then you realize you've lost track, you gotta go back again. Um, but it is the closest approximation to this whole mechanism of this higher essence within us, why it's there, how to reach it. He's got five or six different approaches. That is another thing I like immediately. I am not one who's much into the dogmatic anything. There's billions of people on this planet. I love books that can point the way to where we want to arrive, but are not sitting there going, hey, the only way you can make it is through this pathway and you have to step on uh, balance on one foot and stick your finger in your ear or repeat mantras or you have to have a guru. No, these books are about exciting us enough to activate something within that has us go. That is the wisdom of the overself. It is a, a nice activator and it allowed me to begin this process of reaching my own self. Now, when I was in mad science and steeped in it, for me to use that word, I'm gonna find my own self, um, which and at the time it is myself. Um, is it on a tether ball on a string? Um, is it inside? Is it outside? Am I inside of it? All those were answered through this book. Number three, the Aquarian Gospel of Jesus the Christ by Levi. Another one written in the 1800s. Correct. Yeah. And uh, this particular book, I came to it. It is a book that was written by a fellow named Levy who went to the Akashic Records between the hours of two and four every morning and aligned himself with the vibrational life of, of Jesus. And not only did he reveal what he felt came out of the Akashic, but the information about how Jesus attained his stewardship of the Christ consciousness is so profound without any religious connotation. Now, somebody could say, well, if you're talking about Jesus and the Christ, it, it's religious. But I have to say this book was not in a religious bent. It explained um, how Jesus was educated, how he went through various trials. It 
follows a little bit like the Bible, but it's got a lot more meaning of who this individual was before he became who he became. And when I read about the trials that he went through, it made so much sense to me. It was so profound. And the philosophy interspaced within the words touched me to have a better appreciation, a stronger appreciation of not only that individual's mission, but the love. And I'm going to share that we have a tendency in our Western world to put everybody and anybody on a pedestal that seems a little bit better than us. Whether it is a movie star, whether it is a politician, whether it is a religious figure, or whether it is somebody who has a stack of degrees at a university, we tend to think that they're all knowing. We tend to believe that they have it and we don't. What I hope will be the theme throughout our sharing today is one needs to trust yourself. And these books, and especially the Aquarian, goes beyond just saying, this was Jesus, you can never be like him. No, this book is saying, this is how an individual attained a greater consciousness. Here I was in my sports and business days thinking, I'm conscious, I know what's cooking, but you find as you take the time to, to delve deeper that there is so much more enough to fill 10 libraries like this. Yeah. Book number four, The Life and Teachings of the Masters of the Far East by Baird Spaulding. Now, this Life and Teachings is a six volume set. When I acquired it, it was only five volumes um, back in the late 70s. But uh, another volume was added as a little bit more information was gathered. Supposedly, purportedly, Barrett Spaulding went with a group of individuals into Tibet and met this incredible group of spiritual entities who were living hundreds of years and could do all of the things purportedly done by Jesus and other mystics during their living. Now, in this book, it starts with Barrett Spaulding and a group of people who had no consciousness of this, really the spiritual aspects of, of life, the phenomena part, but there they went they went through all kinds of adventures for several months. They watched individuals levitate, bilocate, do instant healings, all these phenomenal aspects. Now, the reason I say it was purported, there's been a lot of controversy by doubters who go, wait a minute, we cannot find these people anywhere in the uh, China, Tibet area. Uh, there's really no record of this group, but they're missing something very, 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 very important. Perhaps they were there on the physical, but they were definitely there on the inner planes. And this series of books explains exactly how these people attain the abilities that they had for spiritual, physical, instant manifestations. It explains it beautifully and perfectly. It's not leaving anything out. It is a series of books that is exciting as you follow this, this group of, of Caucasians experiencing profound experiences. And I knew instantly that not only was this real, it didn't matter to me, it's the teachings, it is the information. Perhaps they were there, perhaps not. 
but it doesn't lessen one iota for me, the gems of wisdom. And I would say more than likely people on this video right now have heard of Barrett Spaulding and the life and teachings of the masters of the Far East. Um, that's what it is. It's teachings. And so that series and a book I'm going to talk about later called The Kabbalion were very, very important for me in my actual understanding of how we can interrelate and affect physical matter. Without me having to buy courses and take long-winded classes. Okay, so the next book by a man who had a an incredible influence on la your life. Um, the Secret Teachings of All Ages and Times, Manly P. Hall. Tell the little story about how you met and what happened after that. Okay, and I've held up the other books. <laughs> this one is, this is just a little uh, hardcover, but it was, it was 1978 and somebody said to me, um, have you read and studied Manley Hall? My answer was, I, I do not know who he is. Uh, they, this individual told me where he was located. It was very close to my home, actually 10 minutes away or 10 miles. And Manley Hall apparently lectured every Sunday, gave three hour lectures, never used notes for $1. And Sunday was the lecture and the next Friday was a lyceum or a group meeting where there's a blackboard and there were eight key points written on the blackboard from his previous Sunday lecture. And a hundred people gathered on Friday and would talk about the possible meaning. Now in the front were three individuals the day I was there. Pearl Thomas was the head librarian of the Philosophical Research Society, which by the way has 60,000 volumes behind glass. She'd been with Mr. Hall for over 50 years. Two other men had flown in from Missouri and they had followed Mr. Hall for 30 years. So I go to this location and as a beginner, I sat so far in the back because I didn't know anything, any of the people, I was way in the back. A woman in the audience says to the moderators, what does point number six mean? Now, Pearl Thomas was at the front of the room and she put her finger out into the audience. People were moving their heads left and right and she's pointing right to me. Apparently I spoke, I shared things. I don't remember what I said. But when I came to my senses, everybody was looking at me. The group broke up and Pearl Thomas came up to me and she said, how long have, how many books of Manly Halls have you read? I said, none. Well, how many lectures you, have you attended? I said, I've never heard him speak. So she said, well, how, how could you explain that point and dovetail his philosophy? young man, and I was young then, please come and see me. So the next day I was in this library, head librarian Pearl Thomas. Uh, the books are all behind glass, so the librarian has to unlock cases. But after an hour, she said, here's the key, go wherever you like. That night I had a dream. I wrote down the dream. Monday I went back to the library I gave it to Pearl Thomas. She goes, oh my gosh, Mr. Hall has to see this. Three days later, I got a call from Manley Hall. And by the way, it was virtually impossible to meet him personally. The reason was people were calling, uh, hey, uh, this is Plato, I've reincarnated. I wanna meet with Mr. Hall. Hi, this is Jesus. Hi, this is Plato. So he was so well screened, nobody could meet him. He calls me. He, to his office, we met. He looked me straight and he goes, who are you? I said, I'm a student. What do you want from me? My spirit said, 
I want to go into your personal vault and copy materials. And so, to my knowledge, I was the only one before and the only one after that went into his vault and Xeroxed books, alchemical books from the 15, 16, and 1700s. I did it for six months. I'm pointing on the screen because there's a bookcase back there that contains these books. At the time, they were extremely rare because they didn't have the reprints like they do today. In that vault, I found a little notebook. Last second material arrived at the printer too late to be included in his magnus opus. The Secret Teachings is one of the greatest books. And yet, this notebook was saying there were 10 chapters that arrived too late. I Xeroxed that and have held it for 40 years. And finally, his organization never reprinted it. I never saw them. And I finally uh, printed it um, in January of this year. It is very, very profound. Now, you asked me to lead in how I came upon Manley Hall. I will say this. Anybody who reads this book, this is the greatest jump, jumping off point for every religion, philosophy, symbol, Native Eastern philosophy. He was prolific. He was neutral. He's one of the great chain of philosophers from the beginning of time who writes with neutrality and keeps the secret. And it's not, they're not secret. They, they are teachings that have been with us forever. But that would be the story of Manly Hall. Well, there's another bit to that story, isn't there? Because sometime after he died, you got a phone call. I, I'm hesitating to go too too far into these th things with with Mr. Hall and the secret teachings. Let, let's just say that I receive a lot of input from from spirit and phys people on the physical plane who are nudged by their own spirits to contact me. So I'm not sure how much depth, more depth you would like me to go in. Um, I believe that I did share that with you, uh, the, the call that came in. Is it something that you would like? Yes, yes, of course, of course. We want to know. Yeah. You got you got to finish off the story properly. So you must remind me or give me a hint. So you got a call from an attorney asking your name oh, and asking yeah. you to prove who you were. Yes. And, and this was not so much with this book. Um, this has to do with um, a book called The Nemoscope, which is a super microscope from the 50s. Now, I can go into that. But it, it, it's not apropos to Manly Hall, but it's a heck of a story. So I thought, I thought that you were gifted. Somebody passed on and they gifted to you a collection of Manly Hall's books. Uh, no. Okay, I misunderstood that story. Then. Yes, but, but it, it, it is an, an incredible story that perhaps either at the very end or later. Let's we'll talk about that out. later then, because- But, uh, but I, I will say that I've had several visitations from Manly Hall and people always debate, oh, when we have dreams, is, is it real? Everything is real. If it goes through our mentals, there's a reality to it. And he, he has come to me um, several times and I treasure, I treasure those moments. Okay, well, let's move on to number six, The Modern Bethsaida by J.R. Newton. This book was published in 1876. It is the life of one of the most profound and gifted healers of all time. J.R. Newton cured 250,000 people purely by love. His 
the testimonials about the healings came from mayors, governors, sheriffs, lawyers, newspaper editors, members of the US Congress. He was so profound in his mission in the early 1800s. And the life and labors of Dr. J.R. Newton or the modern Bethesda was his autobiography written around the time when he finally retired. I was drawn to it because I had been told that I had a, a gift of healing. And so I was doing healing work, distant healing work, spiritual healing work. But when I read this modern Bethesda, when I read of pure love, Newton's phrase was, as to the power of healing, it is a demonstration of the power of love. I tell a person I love them, I show them I love them, and the disease must depart. Those words were just so profound, and yet he did not have a church, he didn't um, have courses, but here's what he said. Every brother is my most loving brother. Every woman, every man is my most loving brother. Every woman is my most beloved sister. I, I love them with all of my being. And I started reading. In fact, you can't see, but the, the hairs on my arm are standing up now. It was interesting. You, you said uh, earlier, Sandy, um, something about what did I feel when I read certain things? The feeling of the magnitude of healings, the people who were crippled for 15 years, never stood on their feet and were cured in 10 minutes walking around rooms. Of course, we have these on the TV and there's the gospel hour and, and you were healed instantly. We know some of it is real, some of it is not. Here is an individual who the testimonials, the magnitude of the healing, but the gentleness of his spirit and his soul, it was said that nobody could argue in his presence. They, they, they couldn't argue. When he spoke, his, the, the resonance of his voice is what, like the clearest symbol just a sound. And he said that, or it was said that when he spoke in a room, and by the way, he was from uh, the New England area, he went over to England and I acquired books about his tour over there. He would speak and when he threw out his arms to heal an audience, you could hear a percussion sound like, like an explosion throughout the whole hall. And yet, the man who worked as his secretary for 30 years said, JR said we could all do it. He could do it because he knew he could do it. We couldn't do it because of our lack of faith that, that we could do it. Newton constantly says what he did, all people can do. He was on a ship going from Panama to San Francisco, yellow fever broke out. There were two doctors on board. Every person that the doctors work with died, including the two doctors. Everybody that J.R. Newton worked with, all of them survived. And when you read the testimonials, when you read about Margaret Fuller, and this was in the Ohio newspaper, Margaret Fuller, fell off a horse at 12, was totally paralyzed from a waist down. She ended up having nine children, two of them in the Union Army. None of her children had ever seen her stand or walk a day in her life. Two men held up their arms, carried her into the room. 10 minutes later, she walked out of the room. The testimonials coming from the newspaper editors, lawyers, 
And she said, oh my gosh, this is funny to be upright and see the world like this. Newton told me to be hardy, go and eat a steak and have no fear. He did 250,000, there must be maybe a thousand in this book with their street address. I, I've never seen that before. So you can see how passionate I am, mm. but that enlivened my feeling of the possibilities that we all have. That is the, the modern Bethesda. And by the way, now that has also been reprinted, uh, but in, in my day, uh, you know, when I was searching this kind of raggedy, uh, it, it wasn't so easy to find, but it was certainly worth it. Mm. What a great story. So number seven, a phrase we often hear, let there be light by <laughs> Darius Dinshaw. Yes. I don't know. I hope the, these are kind of coming through. Yes. I hate to be yes. a constant talking head here. Um, I had a dream in 1978 that people could cure themselves and others using color. Now, I'm sure there's some people who, who think, well, of course that's, that's known. But it came as a complete surprise to me with my math science background. You, you could heal by color. And so I found, ended up finding an individual named Dinshaw Gadiali who had a system called the spectrochrome system, a perfect 12 color system. Dinshaw was a yogi from India, came to the United States in the early 1900s using color, the visible light spectrum. And he started giving exhibitions in the city of New York. Eventually 500 U.S. medical doctors were using spectrochrome throughout the United States. Now, Dinshaw would do this for his class of doctors, two things. One, he would have them cover his eyes and then put any book of their choice behind his, one of his knees, either his left knee or his right knee, and he would read the book they brought with his knee. Or he would put uh, pads on his eyes, bandage, take a bicycle and ride through busy streets, completely covered up. Once he got <laughs> the audience's attention, then he, would, then he taught his classes on how to use color. And this let there be light system, when I came upon it, seemed so easy to use. And since that time, I've worked with more than 300 people, animals, plants, utilizing this inexpensive color system that you plug the light source into the wall. You have very specific gelatin filters that the light passes through. You are told in this Let There Be Light book the exact color you're using, why you're using the color, what part of the body. And I have had great success, including in 1984, my father was suffering back spasms. He checked into Kaiser Permanente Hospital in Hollywood, California. During the test, they used a, a needle that was not clean. And he ended up with an infection that ran from C3 to C7 and left my dad a complete quadriplegic. My mom called me. I came. I met the head of neurosurgery, Dr. Mahomar, and he goes, <coughs> uh, uh, are you going to interfere with the electrical outlets in this place? And I said, no, but I don't want to be bothered. My mother or I were, were bringing this device in. And he said, how would color work? And I said, doctor, what do you do for infant liver syndrome? Yellow jaundice, Billy Rubin. Well, we put, you put people, babies under a blue light. And if you don't, it's a hundred percent fatality. 
doctor, that's color therapy. We went into the hospital, used it twice a day. After the first week, Mahomar was doing his rounds with five other doctors. Comes to my dad, the quote quadriplegic, Mr. Ross, try to wiggle your toes. My dad says, you better stop back, step back or I'm gonna kick you in the face. The doctors laugh. <laughs> well, at least he's got a good sense of humor. Step back. So they did. And my dad proceeded to raise his legs into the air. Six weeks later, he was checking out of Kaiser Permanente. This was 1984. Now my, the doctors, the nurses thought my dad, it was not a miracle. Nobody comes from quadriplegia. They wanted to start quadriplegic training. My mom says to the nurses, oh my gosh, we're so excited. Could we just look at, at my husband's hospital records? Now, I'm sure I built up some karma, but guess what? I accidentally walked home with those records. So we have the records. Complete quadriplegia, a neurogenic bladder. He'll never urinate again on his own. Well, we got my dad home and three weeks later, he was driving a stick shift car. We used another device, stimulated his bladder and he urinated for the next 15 years of his life. Why do I like let there be light? Why do I like the spectrochrome system? It's all upside with no downside. Color started with Pythagoras in 520 BC. It has been used all over the world. But here's one thing you haven't heard. Mary Jane Smith was found OD'd in front of her color projector, which was blazing away. Just the upside is fantastic with literally no downside. Let there be light. I'm sure there's a lot more to it. And my experience has shown me for some of the most dilatorious problems you can imagine, it's very, very successful. Can you tell why I like that book? It's frequency, isn't it? I mean, 100%. And 100%. Sandy, thank you. It, it is frequency. Everything is frequency. Love, the, the supreme, ultimate frequency. Um, but yes, it is, it is frequency. And by the way, in the Let There Be Light book is the musical note equivalent of the colors. In, the, in this book is the various elements and their color signatures. So if somebody needed to have injected a certain mineral or whatever, you can do it through color. It, it, it really is phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. I've heard of people using color um, and essential oils, also yeah. frequency, on reflexology points on the body. Yes, on of the course. Toe, feet, yeah. And um, together, you know, she has phenomenal success. Yeah. And, and, and again, I like, I like techniques and approaches where you're not putting yourself in worse harm. Uh, the, the TV commercials are ludicrous. Uh, there's times to use standard techniques, but when I hear if you take cholesterol, side effects, a rare but fatal brain disease. I mean, it really has gotten ludicrous, all of us going away from not only trusting our own selves and what we can do, but we're gambling. You might as well go to Las Vegas. You're, you're gambling. Okay, number eight, the journals and miscellaneous notes of Ralph Waldo Emerson. Wow, what do I say about Ralph Waldo Emerson? He, I believe he has more quotes in print than anybody who has ever lived. He was called the New England Brahmin. He could write on Eastern philosophy as well as Western philosophy. He kept a journal from his first day in college until the day before he died. Harvard University Press, and this was in the 1800s, Harvard University Press went through a 16-year period of reprinting 
all of his journals and notebooks. It never appeared as a set, although we're very fortunate to have two sets that I finally accumulated book by book. To show you how I value it, there was a fire from the 1970, uh, let me say, the 1994 Northridge earthquake in Los Angeles. The fire was so close, I was told I would have to abandon the books. Out of all these books, the only thing I took was this set of Emerson's journals, not the alchemy, not the old books. I took that because I felt if I'm on a mountain and I have very little to read, he wrote about everything, but it's transcendentalism. It's that transcendental philosophy of hugging trees, of loving nature, of becoming one with everything that is, that was stimulating. And as you read his journals, he commented on books at the time, individuals at the time, ancient philosophy. Um, again, I, I have kept, I have notebooks of my notes through his notebooks, and I have three notebooks <laughs> just of quotes. You know, sometimes you start and you go, uh, some people highlight, I don't do that with books, but you start writing, oh, this is great. You know you've reached something when the book you have, you go one paragraph and you're highlighting again. And you go until you realize, geez, that's why I have the whole book because e everything is a gem in here. So that set um, has been really wonderful for me for not only the idea of nature and being one, but it gave me a great appreciation for Eastern philosophy. Too many people in the West, I think, overwork and tax their minds trying to learn all these Eastern terms because that's the only way to reach enlightenment. Emerson breaks it down in a parlance where you know he understands, but you're not using a plethora of, of Eastern and uh, Tibetan language that, that we don't understand. And as a little break here, I, I wanna share the, this story about books and learning. There was a business executive, heavy duty businessman. And during the night, something happened to him. I'm sure it was a dream because the next morning he thought, oh my gosh, what is the meaning of life? Why am I here? What is the secret of the universe? So he talked to a friend and a friend says, oh, you need to go to the metaphysical bookstore down the street. So he goes over and says, I wanna know the meaning of life. What is it all about? Do you have the answer in the bookstore? No, you need to go to Tibet and talk to the yogis. T Tibet, yes. So off the individual went. He starts climbing the mountains. It was the wrong time of year. He wasn't dressed properly. He passes out. Next thing he knows, the yogis are sitting, warming him up. And they said, what are you doing here? And he said, I've come to learn the secret of the universe, my purpose in life. Why am I here? Can you tell me? And they look at him and they go, no, we don't have the answer. He goes, where can I find the answer to life? And they said, where are you from? And he said, I'm from New York. And they said, that's where the answer is. And if you were from San Francisco, it would be in San Francisco. And if you were in Boston, it would be there because the answer is always within us. These books, all books, even people we meet, should be people who point the way, but they're sharing their way. Our way is going to be unique and beautiful. And every one of these books is not harping on anything. They are enlivening us to more of our true potential. What are we capable of? What can we achieve? And so 
that system, while it is not bringing somebody, I, I would say there is some references to love. Here's what I would say. Emerson said, when I read, when I find narrow viewpoints, I find narrow reading. Imagine one's whole life. Here's an encyclopedia, but your whole life is P. So you're, you're like this, P. That's all you know. And someone says, yoga. Yoga, that's a Y. Oh my God, Q R S T Y. We are very, very limited in our perspective. But when you read something like this set, it broadens your horizons. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what books do. It opens all the doors. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's move on to number nine. Um, and we'll move a bit more quickly because I really do want to have time to talk about uh, and nothing happened. Number okay. nine. You call it Kiba, Kibalian, I call it Kaibalian. I Doesn't like matter. your way too. <laughs> By the three initiates. Correct. So what was it about this book? that? Well, this book, um, it's funny because most people do not know. It just says the three initiates, but it was written by a man named Atkinson or Yogi Ram Shikara uh, in the early 1900s. It is about the seven great hermetic laws that underpin all existence. Things like the all is in all, the mental universe, vibration, polarity, rhythm, gender. While those are just terms, they underpin everything existing in the world so that we understand. Hot and cold are actually the same only different in degrees. They are the same substance. Mm -hmm. So the Kibalion, Kibalion, was so enlightening in its few pages, bringing Egyptian and Hermetic philosophy that it opened up such vistas for me. It was key in helping me understand the phenomenal aspects of life, or from an esoteric standpoint, physical phenomena. Because once reading that and understanding that all religions and philosophies are basically the same, the, the world of nature, the spiritual world, the solar system and the planets revolving are the same as what we have in our body, it all came together that the all is in all and all is in the all. Very, very, very simple. But from this began my journey with what more is possible. And we are limited only by our belief and our thoughts. Unfortunately, those belief or thoughts generally come from other people. Yeah. And so whether it is our upbringing or school, or somebody we admire, we are going to find that it, it is our belief systems that hold us back. Most people would say, well, you, you have to believe for something to happen. Well, that is true. But the opposite is always true. I acquired a book, which is not on my list, by Charles Kellogg, the great naturalist of the Kellogg family in the 20s. He could imitate any bird call. He was called the, the bird singer. He could duplicate any bird in nature. But one other thing he could do, through his voice, he could affect a flame or fire. So they did an experiment in San Francisco in the 1920s they had something called a sensitive flame, which is a flame in a tube. And at exactly 9 p.m. one evening, this was at a fire station. Kellogg went to KGO radio in San Francisco and was told at certain minutes 
to make the flame go down, up, and go out just from his voice, which he did perfectly. AP, UPI all reported it. I'm reading this and I'm thinking, that is phenomenally affected fire. Well, I'm reading a book on Sufism, and I read that the Sufis could do demonstrations standing in fire, manipulating fire, and I ended up meeting a Sufi who could generate that note. And then I met a Laplander from Finland. Laplanders sing notes and can affect physical elements. And this woman from Finland showed me how she could affect fire. Why am I sharing this story? None of those notes were the same. They weren't even harmonics. I mean, they, they weren't. What did it tell me? Is it the notes or is it our faith? Is it our belief? Is it the knowledge that we can do that? And so if they're in their culture, that's what they believe. And so the belief is good on one aspect, but never let it hamper because we go, oh, this is not possible. Everything is possible. Yeah. We've only got to have one person do it. And, and then everyone can do it. Everybody yeah. can do it. But yeah. here's the big thing. You have to, not you, excuse me. One must have trust. Why don't we trust ourselves? Who's ever on this picture right now, ask yourself, why do we not trust that we can do these things, that we have access to all wisdom in the universe? Anyone you meet is no wiser than you. They may have more awareness of it at that moment, but ultimately we all are connected with the same conduit, but we must trust ourselves. Because we've been taught to give our faith away. Uh, Put your faith in others and not in yourself. Correct. Yeah. Now we're going to change that through your show and all the <laughs> shows. We're going to change it through books. So number 10, the final book, Paracelsus, His Mystical and Medical Philosophy by Manly Hall. And it's, uh, it's almost five past the hour. So we only can spend a few minutes on this one. Paracelsus was the greatest alchemist in the history of the world. He could do things purported by alchemists. He was a magnificent philosopher. Um, I have had past lives with him, um, been there as he did numerous things. He was the one who coined and worked with the nature spirits. He, um, what can I say? Uh, he has been such an influence with the magnitude of his interaction with nature, what we are all capable of doing. His observations of the world are so profound. Um, just with, with short time, I could never do him justice, but I would tell people that uh, this Paracelsus book, Paracelsus and his life, uh, also extremely profound. And um, there, he may be listed as number 10, None of these books fit in that order because mm. anytime something's up, they go to number one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, probably even if we had another hour, you couldn't do him justice because uh, how can you? How can you? So let's talk about And Nothing Happened, But You Can Make It Happen, which is your book. And it is available on digital and in paperback. Now, some of the things in that book you know, I've read the book. Uh, I've read it more than once. Um, you know, I'll just quote a few things. Uh, an African herb that can that has been shown in multiple studies to eliminate the need for a heart bypass in 90% of scheduled surgeries. Um, Colour, we've talked about. Dr. Harold Burr, Yale University, documented invisible energy fields surrounding all living organs organisms that keep matter in shape and he could predict where and when a cancer tumor would develop before it was ever seen or registered on any medical test equipment that was in the 1930s the dia pulse machine confirmed by more than 20 universities 
and research centers to accelerate healing at more than twice the human at uh, the normal speed used in the olympics the fda banned it for 15 years because they claimed it couldn't possibly work despite hundreds of double blind trials studies around the world that prove it does and so many more stories like that i mean your book is full of them but you know, here's, here's the funny part of this because i am not a marketer here i show you all those books i don't even i do not have my own book <laughs> you don't have it with you <laughs> I, I don't have it with me i my, my intent isn't you know always certainly to, on this show was not to to sell anything but that's why i'm kind of chuckling here this is a book that needs to be discussed it needs to be spoken about and it needs to be read by anyone who believes they can't yes and you mentioned earlier vibrational medicine these are all uh vibrational aspects but see the whole book none of them are pharmaceutical and therefore they when we say and nothing happened they didn't make it into mainstream medicine because physics thought are a little bit of a threat to things that are going on i don't go into that much i don't want to other than to say um when we say and nothing happens is not diminish the magnitude of these big scientists and medical doctors uh, Bjorn Nordenstrom shrinking cancer tumors with electricity. He was the past chairman of the Nobel Assembly. And yet when he talks about electricity, they wouldn't give him the time of day and he had to bring his technique to China. So my book is virtually all physical si and science and vibration. My other book I have is on dreams and Manly Hall and I just began writing, my fourth book will be The Guidance, My Poetry That Has Guided Me Throughout My Life. The poetry that came from spirit with spiritual gems. So I'm just comparing those books with this hard line. Here's another one. Two French doctors made visible the entire acupuncture meridian system using a radioactive isotope technician 99 and CAT scan cameras. I have met hundreds, if not a thousand acupuncture people that didn't even know that they did that. Their work was accepted in the French Academy of Science. It validates acupuncture and the meridians and the energy. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. And here's one for the ladies, a presentation made in 1954 that measured the voltage of one cell cast off in the vaginal tract that could determine whether a woman had uterine, cervical, or no cancer. There was never a false negative, and the positive was 94% accurate, completely non-invasive. What the hell happened to it? And that's it. And I'm going to tell you, the researcher who came up with that has... 15 pages of biography. He has numerous, I mean, papers. But again, that gets us in the area of vibration and physics. And during his year when he came up with it in the 50s, um, there was really more of a kibosh on a, a lot of these techniques. So, uh, you know, I used to lecture extensively on the politics of medicine, but here's what I noticed, Sandy. I would have people so upset because they go, why don't we have this? What? This is the United States, what? And then I said, what am I actually doing here? Um, I like to leave people happy and in a, in a good mood. You still want people informed, but it's the ultimate frustration that these things could be so successful, even by the most prestigious. If you're the chairman of the Nobel Assembly and you can't get your therapy, what hope does anybody well, else have? But the real, the real thing is, Stephen, that you know, yes, people may get upset because they're not available to them now. 
but people need to be upset in order to understand that what they have been conditioned to believe isn't the truth. You know, and they, you can only do that by showing them the evidence. I mean, I've been using life machines for about 15 years. I know, you know, how effective they are. Yes. I've never had a problem with them. You've got in your book and in your library, you've got evidence, Royal Rife, who demonstrated with a number of fellow doctors, his peers, who all were very excited, who all went to dinner. You've got a photograph of them sitting yeah. at dinner. And then yeah. later on, every single one of them denied everything, even though yeah. one had written a letter, which you also have in your book, saying, you know, how wonderful it was. And yeah, they he, all denied he still, it. He was still dreaming about the effects. Yes, that was a dinner party in 1931, celebrating the end of disease and illness. Yeah. Um, and again, we've been very fortunate. The uh, Another discussion is the universal rife microscope, which was 10 times more powerful yeah. than any other devices. I was very fortunate to have it in my physical possession for two years. It was built in 1933. So we're aware of how profound it was, how scientific. By the way, the people working, uh, because they found the frequency, the life frequency of 60 viruses, microbes, uh, that led to various diseases and illnesses. Um, it, it was profound research, and the doctors involved were uh, E.C. Rosenau of the Mayo Clinic, Northwestern University, John Hopkins, USC School of Medicine. These were the researchers. We have 500 personal letters of them back and forth, but you're very right. What some of the letters show when you read them from the 30s is they were feeling pressure. They actually were getting pressure from a source you wouldn't believe, the AMA even, because the AMA began taking advertisements for pharmaceuticals in the AMA journal. And um, the other thing that hurt Rife was the electron microscope came out, RCA, tons of money. But here's the difference. And I have pictures that demonstrate the electron microscope, you, you see shadows. So having 2 million magnification doesn't help. But the Rife microscope at 60,000 diameters, you could watch specimens live. You could watch what, what was happening. That would probably be a whole, again, a whole show in itself is just the magnitude. But here's something for today's show. Rife refused to accept the theoretical limitation of a life being. And because of that, where microscopes now are 1,800 magnification, we had them at school and research, this thing did 60,000 magnification. And it's a tease. The story you asked me about the phone call, and I mentioned the word nemoscope. Another microscope, the nemoscope existed, which is 20 times more powerful than what Rife had. And you could see down to Adams in 1953, which everybody says is impossible. Scientists say it can't be done. It must have been Photoshopped. But the materials I have were before computers. So it wasn't Photoshopped. It is vibrational pictures. I think, you know, the thing to take away from all this, I mean, I want to ask you before I say what I was going to say, is anybody, to your knowledge, has anybody today picked up some of those technologies and using them? With the microscope? No. Any of them? Any of the ones that we've talked about? Um, any of the ones uh, in your book? No. Not I would say knowledge. that they're, they're not in mainstream knowledge. medicine, even though um, they should be. In order for somebody to use Nordenstrom's shrinking of cancer tumors with electricity, which, which was written up in Discover Magazine, I, I flew Nordenstrom out to speak at our conference. You cannot use that until you have exhausted everything else in Western medicine, which means 
chemotherapy, radiation, surgery. Well, I would say, well, what's left? <laughs> what well, is nothing that? left of what? you after There's that? Nothing well. left of you. you <laughs> your immune system, your yeah. everything's going. And then maybe they'll let you do it. Now, when Nordenstern gave his patent to China, 5,000 medical Chinese medical doctors had a 94% cure rate with no adverse effects. Nordenstrom has no adverse effects. And here's the real kicker on this. Nordenstrom is credited with the discovery of needle biopsy. So Sandy, needle biopsy, chairman of the Nobel Assembly, and nothing happened. By the way, somebody wrote, that is the title of my book, and nothing happened, but you can make it happen. Yeah, yeah. Is, is, um, are the Chinese doctors still using that? Oh, yes, absolutely. So if anybody really wanted it, they could find out who's using it and they could go to China. I don't think we'd want to go right now. No, not right but, now. But you know, <laughs> the, the sad part is why we have to travel so, so far and out of the country with different time zones and, and food. Well, but the thing is. to take from everything you've said tonight is ultimately, we don't need these technologies. Ultimately, if we have the belief, we can heal ourselves. Sandy, I love you for summing up our entire show. Yes, anything that's generated by these machines, my feeling after 46 years is we are capable of doing the same thing, whether it is color, sound, these electromagnetic machines. It all resides within us. How do we reach it? Trust yourself. And I want to interject this, this dream and something I've shared many times with people. Right before a lecture, several, quite a few years ago, my dream was I was walking along the ocean. Behind me were all of the seekers, all of the seekers in the world. And in front of me, I noticed a woman dressed in blue with a microphone, but there was fog and smoke around her. And as I got closer, I noticed it was Sophia, the goddess of wisdom. And to my right or her left were horseshoe stands with authors and lecturers and, and people with courses, well-meaning people, nice people, people you've heard of. And, I, and they were obliterating this woman. And I thought, oh my gosh, what am I being shown here if they are partially obliterating the truth? A big wind blew off the ocean. And I heard these words, all that is need is a beautiful heart, an open mind, and a humble spirit. And the man that we didn't speak much of said, he didn't say those words, that came in my dream. Here's what he did say. If you want to learn the essence of any herb, vitamin, a herb, plant, tree, sit down humbly before it. And it will tell you its essence and how to use it. And that's what he did. And I share with people, you can also add other individuals. If we sit quietly, if we remain open in our mind, people sometimes say to me, Are, you came up with something. Did you read my mind? And I go, no, I do not read minds. I am apprehending what you are putting out. It's all vibration. It's all these thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. When you get in resonance, everything opens up. Yeah. That's how Edward Bach created the flower remedies. Yes. Mm. Stephen, thank you for joining us. Um, you know, this has been above and beyond. Um, all of our interviews are great. And it's always fascinating to listen to different people's journeys and their books but there's been you know this has just been more than that 
So thank you. Well, again, thank you for not only the invite, but allowing me to share. And I would leave you and everybody else with this. With love, in love, and through love, may everybody reach their highest and best on our continuing journey. Thank you. Stephen Ross, thank you very much. The books that Stephen has written, Manly P. Hall's Unpublished Pages of the Secret Teachings of All Ages. You can find that on the website lesscomplicated.net, along with his book, A Grand Design of Dreams, Contemplating Divine Revelation, and his book, um, And Nothing Happened, But You Can Make It Happen. Um, Stephen, that's it. Thank you very much. Bye, now. And everybody at home, you can also check out uh, World Research Foundation, WRF.org. Thanks for joining us. If you want to be the first to be noted, notified of these events, you can sign up for our newsletter at nobsspiritualbookclub.com. Uh, you can also download an MP3 recording if you prefer to listen in your car. Um, this particular video will be available in about a week's time. It will also be available as a podcast on all of the major podcast sites, Anchor, Spotify, iTunes, etc. And um, one other thing I want to say is that there will not be um, an event next week because I'm going to be away. But the week after, we are moving our venue and we're moving our day. We're moving to Thursdays at 10.30 um, a.m. Pacific time. And we will be live streaming these videos through all of Um Times magazines and the radio network's Facebook pages, which have sizable audiences. So um, I'll keep you posted if you sign up for the newsletter. Thank you very much, everybody. And again, Stephen, thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.